I'm Kevin, always who I was for, I'm BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today I'll be taking a look at the G.I. Joe's second flamethrower, the 1988 Char Broil. Char Broil makes no cartoon appearances, but makes his first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe in issue number 80. Take a look at Char Broil's accessories first. He comes with, well, of course, a flamethrower. A highly detailed accessory, actually. Uh, not based on any real-world military flamethrower that I know of. It's a very fanciful, sci-fi-looking device, but it still looks like a flamethrower with this nozzle, which actually has a uh, opened end there. And, of course, the spark igniter right here. It does have an attachment for a hose right there on the bottom of the foregrip, which goes all the way through. So I suppose you could attach it to either the left or right side, depending on which hand that you actually have the uh, figure holding this thing on, which is kind of nice. And, of course, it is attached by this hose, which the contents list on the card calls a flame retardant hose. Although I suspect that that's just what it's called. It is not actually flame retardant. I hope uh, nobody tests that because I'm fairly sure that it is not. It's a fairly unique hose, very thick, but it's also very pliable. I kind of wish it was a tiny bit longer, and I definitely wish these little nubbins were a bit longer as well. Because putting a very soft hose peg into a hard plastic hole is a very difficult proposition and it's ch it's just a tiny bit short so that while it does stay in there quite firmly if you're moving it around in the figure's hands it actually tends to pop out quite easily rather unfortunate of course the hose was pegged in right there with the uh, hole actually going all the way through so you could attach it forwards or backwards Although in this case, I'm not quite sure why you would attach it backwards. The contents list on the card calls this a pressurized thermochemical backpack. So this thing has uh, quite a bit of uh, stuff to do, not just holding the uh, fuel. It also has a lenticular sticker, which is very interesting, giving you a look of the inside guts. Kind of like the 1986 bat. I'm not quite sure why you would want um, like a window on something which uh, holds fuel. And quite frankly, the design of this is rather, rather steampunk. You know, it's um, I mean, you see the big hose here, which sort of connects the detail from the hose, which goes off of here, which is rather nice. But this thing doesn't seem doesn't seem to have the very um, the very streamlined, very um, to the point aesthetics that the um, 1984 blowtorches fuel packs actually had. Well, and finally, he comes with one more accessory, and that is his helmet, or what the contents list on the car calls a thermo insulated oxygenated helmet. Um, I have a bit of contention with the word oxygenated because I don't think that that's exactly the meaning that they were going for here. But, just pop it off here and take a good look at it. It's very unusual. It's a, it's a hard plastic and quite frankly it's a little bit hard to get this thing onto the figure's head. You sort of have to put it on an angle and then just kind of put the bottom mouth bit over his nose in order for the thing to fit on. I've actually had three of these figures so far and all of them have really tight helmets. So I know it's not just mine, it's, um, I don't know, it just seems like a fault with this sort of um, helmet design. Just a tiny bit too small. The red eyes, the, like the integrated goggles or visor, and this strange, almost triangular cobra-like vent on the top really makes this guy look like a bad guy with this helmet on. It really just doesn't look like a G.I. Joe. If you take a look at the artwork, 
Check out his crazy eyes beneath the visor. I'm really beginning to think that this guy started off as a, as a bad guy. The design of the figure has quite a science fiction vibe to him. Especially with all the silver that's all over him. His accessories were silver and it continues with the paintwork on his knees, on his chest plate, which again, just like the backpack, has all of these, I think what they, they call them in um, <laughs> engineering circles, greeblies, which I, I really don't know what they would do. I mean, sure, I'm guessing that this is not only fireproof, but also like it has a coolant or something like through it. He also has these like yellow patches, which I'm not quite sure whether they're padding or whether they're part of a cooling system throughout the outfit. I don't really know. But then, like I said, it's very sci-fi because it's silver. And then he has these, um, these shoulder guards. Which again, to me, uh, I tend to think of that as a kind of a sci-fi kind of a thing. And here he is all geared up, and you can see that the amount of silver on him has just increased. But it, it's sort of tempered by the fact that he's wearing a brown jumpsuit underneath here. It's sort of a subdued color. You would think that someone like him would be wearing a bright hazmat color, like yellow or bright orange or something like that. But not brown. I mean, it goes fairly well with the yellow and the little pops of red. As a matter of fact, he has a little tiny bit of red on the back of one of his arms for some strange reason. And I think that's primarily, to me, what makes him look more like a Joe. It's his color scheme. I think that if they went with some something a bit brighter, he might actually have looked more like a Cobra at that point. It's pretty easy to conclude that Charboil took over flamethrower duties from the 1984 Blowtorch, who is, to this day, uh, the more recognizable flamethrower of the G.I. Joe unit. And you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, he, this guy is a bright, almost neon in his color scheme, but you expect that from someone who's handling hazardous materials and has a specific, uh, uh, I guess, armor on him, which just screams hazardous duty. And here's what I'm talking about as far as the uh, fuel tanks go. This is pretty much what uh, man packs actually look like with the uh, the two main um, fuel cylinders and this pressurized little part on the side here. Whereas Charb Royals is all kinds of craziness. I don't know what could come out of this thing. So just who would Charb Royals opposite number on the Cobra side be? Well, by 1988, we still don't have a dedicated flamethrower on the Cobra side. So, I might have to look at the 1986 Bats, who do have a flamethrower hand attachment. And the card art for him actually does depict that rather prominently. But he has so many other attachments, and he's not a dedicated flamethrower. However, by 1991, we actually get Cobra's first flamethrower, the 1991 Incinerators. So yeah, they're all a couple of years apart, uh, especially shelf-wise. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking kids probably wouldn't have been interacting with these guys if they bought them straight off the shelves. But the Incinerators actually do make a very interesting rivalry to Charbroil, especially when you consider what they're wearing. Charbroil and the Incinerators are both wearing a lot of metallic silver. And while the incinerator does have that red visor over his face, and he has sort of red visor like goggles here, the incinerators have that bright orange outfit that I was talking about, where it looks more like the hazmat um, dangerous chemical, dangerous material handling outfits that people actually do wear out in the field. So this guy actually does make a very interesting contrast in that regard. For people who like hunting down cheap variations on G.I. Joes, there were actually two for Char Royal. The first one being on the file cards. And as you can see, I have two file cards. One from the original 1988 release, because you can see the 87 and 88 figure roster on the back. And one from the 89 re-release the following year, with the 88 and 89 roster on the back. And the variant is in the serial number 
as you can see the original has an all numeric serial number but starting in 1989 they started changing that and adding letters in there and this is something that Hasbro I think was starting to do just so that they weren't copying real servicemen serial numbers on here the other a more popular variant is the paintwork on his eyes. Now I have the more common version of Charbroil where his eyes are the same red that they use for his eyebrows and hair but somewhere along the line they thought well red eyes don't look very good on a human being so they went and changed it to black. This is something that you probably see on most of the later release figures so while they might be a little bit rarer, they don't really go for any much more than a regular Charbroil figure does. According to the Yojo website, Charbroil's face is actually a modification of an earlier G.I. Joe head. That being the 1987 Knockout from the Balforce 2000 subline. At first they might not seem like it, but they actually do share a lot of, of features like a very a uh, squarish type of head and very prominent jawline. Personally, I kind of like uh, Charbroil's expression a bit more. This one t uh, tends to be a little bit older, a little bit more chiseled, whereas his is a little bit more fleshed out, giving him a sort of a warmer expression. If you're looking for a Charbroil on the aftermarket, I hate to say it, but he's not very popular. And you can find him with all of his accessories fairly easily, keeping his price actually kind of down on the aftermarket. So he's it's actually fairly cheap. And that's a shame because he is actually a fairly uh, recommendable figure because of how sturdy he actually is. And despite the fact that, yeah, the uh, wire is rather thick and pops off rather easily, I still say that I would prefer that over than a thin wire which cracks rather easily and this is definitely far more sturdier than anything like that and despite the fact that he even comes with a lot of silver paint by this time in Hasbro's uh, development process they actually made the silver paintwork actually fairly robust on figures so it's not like earlier figures where this stuff rubs off rather easily I mean it does on like edges and stuff like that but it doesn't come completely off the way it did with figures just like even from 1987, the year before this figure. And on top of that, even the sticker on the back of the uh, backpack is fairly inset into here. So you don't get a lot of kids accidentally scraping it and pulling it off. It's actually rather deep and held in rather well in there. So that is often not missing on the backpack as well. So it's fairly sturdy and like I said a highly recommendable figure I would say I actually do tend to actually uh, uh, display this guy as a flamethrower whereas a lot of these hazmat and extremely extremely specialty figures sometimes I use them as pilots or gunners or things like that but I actually find this guy to be actually rather uh, pleasant to pose in his firing position
take a look at Char... It's pretty easy to say that Char Burrell took over Firefly... Yeah. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.